morning, everyone. My name is Ted Harris. I'm with the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. On behalf of the PPA, I would like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. This normally takes place the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, we've had webinars now February through, through April of this year, and we also have, the, I think, the next four months scheduled out uh, for our webinar, ser webinar series. So you can check out our schedule on our website. Um, appreciate, all, appreciate you all being with us here today. Before we get started, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. As an attendee, you're gonna be on mute uh, throughout the webinar. With that being said, we do encourage you to interact with our presenters today, and you can do that by asking questions and by typing your questions in the question feature and go to webinar. And what we'll do um, throughout the course of the webinar, we'll collect those and I will moderate them back to uh, Zach and Bob at the end. So really encourage you, if you have a question, uh, we, we present it as an honest, anonymous question at the end. Please feel free to ask. Um, the more questions, the better. The more inter interactive, the better. So please keep that in mind. For some reason, we don't get to your question. I will make sure I connect you with the presenters afterwards to, uh, to get you an answer. <clears throat> at this point, I would like to introduce our presenters. We have Zach Fold and Bob Kibit. Um, they are with Cert Certified Financial Services. Their company actually joined the PPA earlier this year as an associate member, and we're really we're really excited to have them on board and look forward to having them be more, more involved in our organization moving forward. Um, they will be presenting today, everyone exits, how to prepare for a successful exit and high cash flow slash low retirement. So at this point, Zach and Bob, I'd like to pass it off to you. Sounds good. It's good to meet you all. Probably going to meet you in person someday, um, but these are crazy times. So we'll do, do a live webinar. And yes, today's topic, and uh, I think everyone can see my screen, is everyone exits. How to prepare for a successful exit and a high cash flow, low tax retirement. So when it comes to these topics, we'll be covering three general areas. Business value growth, which is how do we make sure your business is, you know, how do we increase the value of your business while still increasing the likelihood of a sale? And what I mean by that is, I mean, when you want to exit and sell your business someday, you can ask for whatever you want. Sky's the limit. But chances are the more you ask for, the lower the probability of a sale. But there are things you can do to make the business more attractive, which is where this section comes in. Then there's exit planning. What, you know, what are the different ways people exit and how to design a plan and ensure that it works? And the last is now that you've sold your business, right? You've put your life work behind you. You've gotten the cash that you believe it's worth. How do you create a wealth and distribution maximization strategy? One that create, creates the highest amount of cash flow with the lowest amount of tax that allows you to live as comfortably as possible in, you know, in your retirements. So the first area, and just to go back to this quickly, there's really three areas of business value growth. There's financial management, there's practice management, and there's people management. These are the areas that, if done well, increase the value of your business. So financial management, you shouldn't have to constantly put money into your business. It should be, a, it should run itself. You want to really put the limits on how much you put into your business. You also want to, frankly, get money out of your business. You got things to pay for. How do you do that? How do you make sure you're not the only one putting money into your business? You want to identify third party sources. That could be bank loans. It could be investors. It could be a family member. But related to that, you, don't, you want to determine what the out of bound sources. You know, Uncle Louie might be willing to, you know, lend you money for business, but the terms might be awful, frankly. That might be an out of bound source. You want to identify credit opportunities. Maybe you want to make sure you have a line of credit set up to be able to pay for things uh, when you need it or when the cash flow is low one month or to the next. You want to make sure revenue stays in the business account while also making sure enough comes home. One of the best ways to ensure that you're able to sell your business is to make sure it is run like a ticking clock or like a well-run car. And that's what a lot of this next section is. The best analogy I can think of is, is when you buy a new car, well, unless you're one of those car nuts, 
you don't want to buy a car that needs a bunch of work. You want a car that you know you're going to put the keys in, the ignition's going to go on, and it's going to go. And that's frankly what most people want when they buy a business. You know, they want to make sure the business organization is organized. Every role in the business should be defined and measurable. The people in the business, they, you know, we've seen people, we've seen businesses where they have someone who's been with the business a while, they like them a lot, but they're not really measuring what they're doing. So they like them a lot, but we don't know if they're doing a good job of what they do. You want to make sure that's communication between roles and departments. No part of the business should run in a silo. Every business should be working, every part of the business should be working together. When you take when you're talking about business vision, you don't want to you want to be strategic and not tactical. The best analogy is, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I read a book recently on the history of the JP Morgan Bank. Everyone's heard of JP Morgan Bank and Morgan Stanley, and no one's heard of Morgan Grenville. And all those three were all the heirs of the original bank. But the first two, JP Morgan Bank and Morgan Stanley, had a strategic vision for their bank. They had a, a, a broad vision that included how it was going to grow, what areas they were going to grow into, and how they were going to do it. Morgan Grenfell, which was the British subsidiary, kind of just went with all the investment banking uh, trends and facts. They don't exist anymore. Well, it tends to constantly identify critical procedures and processes and measure them. You want to, you know, when you have these processes, you need to implement them and monitor their success. If they don't work, you need to change them. And you need to track everything and monitor ratios. These are important because if you could sell a business to someone with all this in place, you know, the person who's buying it knows that they have a business that runs, basically runs itself. It's argued that people are the most valuable asset to a business, the employees. And, if, you know, it's true more in some businesses than in others, but we know it's true to some extent in every business. Employees attract customers, they keep customers with their relationships, and they care about customers and the company. Someone knows if they're buying a business, they want to know that the business comes with awesome employees. They want to know that there's low turnover, and they want to know that those employees are going to stay and do their jobs so that it runs and earns the owner, a, you know, the business earns a profit and the owner earns an income. And don't take this personally, but, you know, if and when you sell your business, they, you know, the, the, the people who are buying the business, they don't want you. Don't take it personally. They want your business. They need to know that it can run successfully without you. And, the, you know, speaking to before, the better the people in the business, the more valuable the business. And how do you do that? And there's some traditional ways and there's some, I'll talk more nebulous kind of holistic ways. But the very basic way you keep good people is you pay them well. You provide benefits. People want to know that your company has a vision. And they want to know that there's opportunity for advancement. I can tell you right now, and I've read about this, Uber as a company isn't the most successful business if you take them straight from a profit and loss perspective. But they have convinced all of their employees that they have an awesome vision and their employees believe in it, which is why they stick around. But even more so, you should know that statistically speaking, it's been studied that more people leave a job, not because they're not happy with these, but because they're not happy with the company's culture, they clash with their manager, they feel there's no room for advancements, maybe they feel they should be getting more out of business. And they, you know, a lot of people want ownership opportunity. Speaking to the last two, if, if someone has a phenomenal employee, you might want to provide them with some kind of excess benefit that can be done on what's called a discriminatory basis. There are certain benefits that you can't do that. A 401k, you can't, it's very hard to say you can't have, you know, you can have a 401k, you can't, but there might be benefits you can provide to one person because they really do bring so much value to your business. And frankly, if I, you know, if someone knows that they either have an ownership stake or will have an ownership stake in the business, they're more likely to stick around. And then when you do sell that business, they get a nice payout and that's incentive. But what's the path to success look like? First of all, while you're growing your business, you need to make sure it's protected. The business is your biggest, biggest assets and it's your source of capital. It's, it's what supports you, your family, your employees, your employees' families. So you need to do everything in, in your power to make sure that anything that could happen to the business from a liability perspective, from a health perspective, from any perspective that could attack the balance sheet of your business is, is in place to make sure it does not happen. And then there's the growth phase. You know, you may not be ready to exit yet. So you need to develop the business and its people. And lastly, exit. Everyone exits. 
And it's where you realize the full value of your business when you sell it to someone, either an insider or an outsider. There is a 100% certainty that you will leave your business. That's just a fact. We've spoken with many business owners in the course of our work. Most have no plan, or if they do, it is in their head and they've spoken to no one about it. Or some people do have a formally written exit plan, but no one has stress tested it. The dress rehearsal, this is what it's referring to. They might say, oh, we're going to sell to an employee, and we'll speak to this a little more later, but they haven't actually stress tested the, sex of, the success of whether that employee can actually purchase it, keep up with the payments if it's some kind of note. The problem is, is that we have found in our industry that most advisors have, you know, in terms of how they approach the different types of exit planning, they have a narrow focus, they have a transactional approach. Many of them really focus on things like buy-sell agreements. The buy-sell agreements are very important, but they're not the whole picture. There's a lack of coordination among maybe other advisors. You might, you know, there's an advisor, there's an accountant, there's an attorney, and these people should all be talking to each other to make sure that whatever exit plan comes into place is, is done correctly in each of those spheres. And they fail to address key issues such as how does this affect family members? You know, how does this affect the employees? Everything needs to be thought of. But it's it's difficult for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Many people we talk to have a lot of advisors giving them micro advice to speak. They're talking about one area of a financial plan, of an exit plan. Frankly, it's a stressful event. Uh, anyone who's built up a business knows this is their baby. Selling it, it's, it's literally like selling their child. And they, they want to make sure that it's going to the right person and they want to make sure they're getting the right value from it. It's the most usually the largest transaction of someone's life. And there's family dynamics. Frankly speaking, they, there could be children involved in the business and you want to make sure that they're, they're happy with either buying the business and what their shares are or who you're selling it to. Or there might be no family members involved in the business. There could be a stabilization issues to address. But going back to before, everyone does exits, and there's really three doors. There's four, but one of the doors is failure, and we don't want to talk about that. There's really three doors a successful business will exit through. They'll sell it to insiders, they'll sell it to an outsider, or they keep it until they die. Toes in or toes up. And they want to make sure along the way, whichever option they choose, that they're increasing the business value. They want to grow the assets of the business. They want to manage the liabilities. But the balance sheet is only part of the story. There's other domains that need to be addressed. One of them is cash flow. The business was frankly started or bought, if, if you bought the business from someone, to create cash flow for you, your family, your employees, and your employees' families. And it lives on its own cash flow. And frankly, it's valued on its cash flow. We've spoken with people in your industry who have talked to us about how when these businesses are sold, the oil and gas industry, it's usually some multiple of a bid which is a which is a metric for cash flow. And frankly, once you sell the business, those net exit proceeds need to create cash flow for you to retire off of. But along the way, while we're managing all that cash flow and the assets and liabilities, we need to make sure the business is protected. It's the biggest asset. I'm going to say it one more time. It's a source of cash flow for you, your family, your employees, and your employees' families. And it must be protected from lawsuits, from catastrophic weather events, from everything. So I'm going to pass it now on to Bob, who's going to get into the nitty gritty of, of how the sales usually works. Um, but that's, you know, in a nutshell, what we do to make sure the business is worth as much as possible and can be sold to someone as easily as possible. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bob Keevan, and uh, just a little little introduction, just so you know uh, where I'm coming from. So I, I've actually been a financial advisor for 42 years. I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, started in the business in the late 70s and actually started right into uh, business planning, estate planning, and personal financial planning. I've uh, been doing that for four decades. I, I teach financial planning, business planning, uh, estate planning within the industry uh, all around the country, and I've been doing that for three decades. Uh, doesn't make me the smartest guy in the business. I don't profess to be, uh, but I do have a good handle on how all of this stuff works. And, you know, to Zach's point, 
you know, over over four decades working with business owners, uh, I can tell you that most business owners start their business for three basic reasons. Uh, there may be others, but essentially, it's they want to be their own boss. You know, they want to call the call the the plays. They want to make the decisions in the business. Um, they believe they can make more money by owning a business than by working for one. And sometimes that's true, sometimes not. Uh, but hopefully over time, they, they get to the point where they make a lot more by owning the business. But they also want to create something of value. So in addition to the higher income, they want to build a business that has significant value. And, and many times they do. But we see very often uh, they don't get to realize that value when they sell. And part of the reason for that is that most business owners, believe it or not, do not actually take the time to formally set up a, an exit strategy. Very often they don't have a plan even in their head on how they're going to do it. And of the ones that do come up with a plan, very few actually take the time to go to an attorney and have it drafted and put into motion. But sadly, even when we find people who have gone to the attorney and they have put their, their exit plan into writing, most of them never did what Zach called the dress rehearsal. In other words, none of them did a financial feasibility study to determine whether or not the sale terms that they've created were actually feasible, whether they would actually work. So, for example, let's let's take a look at a, a typical insider sale, right? So we, we have a gentleman who owns a business and the plan is he has a, a worked out a deal with his star employee that on the day that he retires, she's going to take over the business. And so the way she's going to do that is she's going to give him on his retirement day a significant down payment for the business. And then he's going to finance the remainder of that over the next five or 10 years, right? Hopefully five years because he doesn't want to wait too long to get his money. But he transfers the entire ownership of the business to her with an agreement that she will pay him back over the next five years for that business. The first problem that we run into is while this seems like an okay plan, very often when retirement actually occurs and they, they, they go to start this transaction, we find that she arrives with no down payment. She thought she'd have a down payment, but she doesn't. And so now he has a choice. Do, do we change the deal or does he sell it to her anyway, but just maybe finance a larger amount? And so maybe it was supposed to be a five-year payout, but now because there was no down payment, maybe it goes to a seven-year or a 10-year payout. That's problem number one. Problem number two is she needs to pay him every year and she's already got an income. She's already got a family. She's already got expenses. So the money that she needs to pull from the business in order to pay him is extra annual income. And it has to be over and above what she normally makes to feed her family. So she probably already has a pretty good income because she's the star player in the firm. And now she has to take a much, much larger amount of cash each year to, to be able to pay him. So let's just say, for example, it's an extra half a million dollars that she has to now draw from the business to give to him. But there's another problem that they very often don't think of. When she takes that extra half a million dollars worth of income to give to him, she first has to pay income taxes on that. So there's an additional income tax. So she has to gross up the amount that she takes from the business, maybe to $750,000 a year so that she can pay the income or the income tax and then give him the balance of what's left over. But then when he receives it, he doesn't get it all either because he has to pay income tax on the loan interest for the note, but he also has to pay some capital gains tax. And when you actually do the math on these strategies, very often it turns out that they're simply not financially feasible. The business can't support the amount of cash flow that's required, and the IRS ends up taking more than 50% of the cash flow that moves around on this. So it's a significant tax problem. Most people, it sounds good on the surface, but they haven't done the dry, the dry run or the financial feasibility to see if it works. So we end up with this significant taxation, very often double or even triple taxation. The deal tax very often is well over 50%. Um, it requires a significant amount of cash flow, very often more cash flow than the business can handle. 
And the current owner immediately transfers 100% of the business ownership to the new owner and has completely lost control over what's going to happen next. That creates tremendous risk for the seller because if the buyer runs the business into the ground, the seller is not going to get their money. There's also an opportunity on either side for what we call a bad deal. If the business grows in value after the transfer, then the original owner is going to feel uh, cheated because he's receiving a smaller buyout on a business that's growing every year while he's receiving the buyout. If the opposite occurs, the business decreases in value, then the new buyer feels like they're way overpaying for a business that's just not worth that much anymore. So these are just typical problems that we see with these types of buyouts. And very often, as I said, they just end up not working and people have to go back and renegotiate after the sale. This actually happened to my own father. He owned a business. He had a deal. It was all in writing. When he retired, the buyers gave him some money and they agreed to pay him over the next few years. I think it was eight years. And two years into the deal, they brought him back to the table and they said, we can't do it. The business doesn't support it. And he had to go back and renegotiate his deal or they were going to close the business. We see this happen a lot. There are a, a number of different things that we can do to help a business with these kinds of transactions. And there's a lot of different tactics, a lot of strategies that we can use. Just one example, which, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, would be to sell the business for the lowest defensible value. In other words, the smallest price that we can defend to the IRS. Now that sounds like a good deal to the buyer. It doesn't sound like a good deal to the seller, right? Because the seller wants to get the maximum value. But the reality is the seller doesn't really care where the money comes from. They just want to get the value. So if we can create other, other ways to get value to the business owner, but at the same time, reduce the, the, end of, the ending buyout value, making it easier to make the transaction complete. As long as the business owner gets their money, they're happy. So we may be able to apply stock discounts to, to reduce the tax treatment on this and also reduce the stress on cash flow for the business. There are things called direct payments, which are very often tax deductible that we can use to make up any differences in the sale price to the seller. We can even use deferred compensation programs and, and uh, retention bonus programs and things like that to do both of those things, to both reduce the tax and make up any difference. We want the business owner to get the highest possible value, but how they get it matters. And we can structure a plan that works better, increases the probability of a successful exit, while at the same time getting the seller all of the value that they want for the business. It just takes time and preparation to put these programs together. And most business owners just aren't doing that. There's a, there's a tremendous connection, as Zach mentioned before, between the business balance sheet and the personal balance sheet for the business owner. Um, cash flow moves back and forth from personal to business. Hopefully more comes out of the business than goes into the business, but especially in the beginning, a lot of times we see a lot of cash flow going into the business. And there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of noise going on. And, and most business owners just don't have the time to deal with all of it. And they end up getting frustrated. But the reality is most businesses, uh, business owners are busy working on their business. They're not paying as much attention as they could or should to all of this other stuff. And now they get to the end game. It's time to exit the business. And what they have to realize is that when they exit the business, the money they get from the sale of the business, in most cases, becomes the bulk of their retirement plan. So the proceeds from the business have to produce the cash flow that the business owner is going to live on for the rest of the, the, the business owner and spouse's lives. How that's done becomes really, really important. Wealth distribution, retirement plan distribution is probably the single most overlooked area of financial planning in the United States. Everybody worries about building up this big pile of money, but nobody's really taking the time to understand what's the best way to use that money later on. And there are three major asset strategies that people need to pay attention to. Most people know what the first one is. They've heard of it before. It's asset allocation. Right. And, and so that really has to do with segregating assets 
that are in the market into two or three categories, typically stocks, bonds, and cash, or maybe just stocks and bonds. But the idea is that we want to grow money. We want to get a high return on money, but we also want to do it in such a way that if the market has a downturn, some of the money is protected. In fact, sometimes we hope that while one bucket goes down, another bucket goes up. So asset allocation is a really important asset strategy. Most people are familiar with it. We work with our clients on this all the time, but it's only one of three asset strategies. And of the three, this is the least important. And sadly, most people have never really been introduced to the other two. So the second one is what we call asset location. Asset location has to do with where the money sits on someone's balance sheet. There are only six categories of assets and all assets fit into those six categories. But the categories differ in terms of this, the characteristics, uh, everything from liquidity to market risk to whether or not it produces income to what kind of tax treatment or tax avoidance we can use. So the location of the wealth becomes really, really important because where it's located will determine how we use it in retirement. The third strategy is asset orchestration which has to do with the fact that each of these locations has different ways of accessing the cash, different ways of creating cash flow, different tax treatments. And because they're each different, we don't have to use the same distribution strategy for all of our buckets of, of money, all of our locations of money. In fact, rarely should we. And so the right thing to do is to coordinate these different buckets of money, these different locations of wealth, and orchestrate them in such a way as to create the highest possible cash flow with the lowest possible tax, make sure we never run out of money and still hit whatever legacy objectives we might have. And most people are just not really familiar with how that's done. So let's take a look at an example. Here's a list of the six categories and just some examples of what kinds of things might be in that. So this client has about eight and a half million dollars of assets some of that is their personal property, which it's good that they have those things, clothing, furniture, cars, collections, and things like that. But what, what we're going to do with it will vary compared to other areas. Savings, which has to do with money that is not part of a qualified plan. It's not an IRA or a, a 401k, and it has absolutely no downside market risk, none whatsoever. So no exposure to a downturn in the market. Investments which is money that's also not in a 401k or an IRA or any qualified plan, but it is in the market. So it does have downside market risk. Of course, here we're trying to get higher returns than we would on savings. Retirement plans, which are our qualified plans, those very often are also invested in the market and have downside market risk, but these are part of qualified plans. Real estate, now this is personally owned real estate. So it could be the primary residence, it could be a vacation home. Sometimes we have clients who have rental properties that they own personally, although usually we recommend that they move those to a business entity, an LLC. But so primarily we're talking about their personally owned real estate here. And then there's their business or businesses, which also have value. So altogether, this adds up to eight and a half million dollars, which sounds great. But the location of these assets matters because the proportionality of them matters. Each one will have different tactics in terms of how we access the cash flow. So if we look at them proportionally, this is what it looks like. And for example, if we look at the personal property, hey, nice that they have those things, but that money is not going to produce any cash flow for them unless they start selling their stuff on eBay. Right. So it's nice to have really not going to do a whole lot for them in retirement. The business asset for most business owners is the largest asset that they own, or at least it looks like the largest asset on their balance sheet because they tell us here's what it's worth. And maybe when they retire, that's going to continue to produce income for them, or maybe it's just going to produce gains. Maybe it's even going to do both. But in many cases, unfortunately, it does neither because if they don't have a good exit plan to get that access, get access to that money, then this value either disappears completely or is dramatically diminished. And sadly, over the last four decades, I've seen so many business owners who have a large valuation for their act, for their business. And this, when they retire, this number immediately shrinks to a much, much smaller number 
because they didn't have a good exit plan set up for themselves. There's their personal real estate, which is, again, is nice to have, but unless they're gonna sell it and downsize or liquidate it or, or do Airbnb to create rental income or do a reverse mortgage, this money is probably not gonna produce a lot in terms of cash flow for retirement. Now there's their retirement plans. This is the qualified stuff, the IRAs, the 401ks, the pension plans. Great that they have that. Most clients have a large, most business owner clients have a large amount of money in their qualified plans. And I think most of them recognize, not all of them, once in a while we find someone who's surprised, but most of them recognize that because they didn't pay taxes on this money on the way towards retirement, they're going to have to pay taxes on it in retirement. And so they get that. There's this, I'll be in a lower tax bracket when I retire mentality. What most business owners don't know, in fact, what most consumers don't know, and it's not because they're not smart, it's just because no one ever told them, is that the larger this slice of the pie is in proportion to the other slices, the higher the rate of tax they will pay in retirement, and not just on this money, but on all of it. So if we make this slice too big, I don't mean dollar wise, I mean in proportion to the other slices, we're actually going to increase the tax we pay in retirement for the rest of our lives. Most business owners aren't aware of that. There are three major tax avoidance strategies that the IRS allows us to use with our money in retirement. And when qualified plans were invented, they were made ineligible for all three of those tax avoidance strategies. So while it's okay that clients have money here, and we're totally fine with that, we have to pay very close attention to how big this slice is compared to the other slices, because too large can cause problems. There's this uh, belief of, I'll be in a lower bracket when I retire, but for a lot of business owners, because this is so large, and because the day they retire, they lose so many of the valuable business deductions they've enjoyed for the last few decades, very often we find that the tax rate they pay in retirement is actually higher than it was when they were working. And that's a reverse tax problem. So we have to pay close attention to that. Investments, that's money that's out of the market. I'm sorry, that's in the market, but it's out of qualified plans. That money is eligible for all three of the tax avoidance strategies. So that's great money. And actually, for most of our business owners, if they've done a good job, when they sell the business, the business value moves over to investments and savings. So that can make those two slices of the pie a lot larger, which is a good thing. And then there's savings, again, money that's not part of a qualified plan and it's not exposed to the market. Um, that, is avail that is eligible for two of the tax avoidance strategies. So traditionally, what people are taught to do when they retire is take all of this wealth that they saved up, right? Take up their, their retirement money, their investments, their savings, and if they've sold the business and that turned into investments and savings, that's included. Take all of this wealth and invest it in a portfolio and live off the earnings. That's what we're taught to do. That's been going on for decades in this country. It's just the mindset that people are given by the financial institutions. Save up a pile of money, invest it, live off the returns and we don't want too much risk in retirement that's called an earnings distribution strategy the way that works though is that we take some money we put it in a nice conservative portfolio most experts will tell you today in fact you can google this safe withdrawal rate accounts for retirement are three and a quarter three and a half maybe four percent it doesn't mean you can't earn more than that but you have to be really careful when you're investing money in the market in retirement because Money invested in the market in retirement works differently than money invested in the market during accumulation. And we'll explain more of that separately if anybody has questions on that. But if we have $4 million and we're getting a 4% return on that, that's going to throw off $153,000 a year. Now, I know it seems like it should be 160 because 4% of $4 million is 160. And it would be if we waited until the end of our first year of retirement and then went back and paid everybody. It doesn't work that way in real life. You have to take this money at the beginning of the year. This is actually the interest that we earned the year before. And we get to live on this. We pull this out at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, the account will grow back to $4 million again. 
Well, we have $153,000 that now comes to our house to use for retirement. And every single dollar of that is taxable. Now, I use a 22% rate of uh, tax here. It doesn't really matter. This is just a concept, and I'm going to come back and talk more about tax in a minute. But if that money is all taxable at 22%, we're going to pay 33000 and change in tax. We're going to get to keep and use and enjoy $120,000 a year of net after-tax cash flow off of a $4 million investment. And I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of sad because it's not easy to save up $4 million. And if we're only going to get 120 a year, that's disappointing. That cash flow stays the same every year. The tax stays the same every year. The net cash flow stays the same every year. And there's $4 million of legacy to leave to our children when we're gone, right? So if this is my wife and I, when we both die, we leave $4 million to our kids. Now, by the way, we didn't leave that $4 million to our kids because we told our financial planner that, hey, we don't care how small our cash flow is. We'll live in a shack if we have to in retirement. We just want to make sure our kids inherit $4 million. That's not what happened. In fact, actually, we told our, our advisor we wanted the highest possible cash flow in retirement. And while we love our kids and we want them to get something, we're totally fine with them getting whatever's left over when we're done. Right. And this probably isn't our only asset anyway. There's a house, there's cars, there might be two houses, whatever. The bottom line is that this four million isn't there because we were determined to leave it there. It's there as a byproduct of leaving the money in the bank and living off of the interest. So it's OK that it's there. But it was, certainly wasn't our objective. This strategy, although it's widely used, and this is what everyone is taught to do, it's actually the worst distribution strategy a person could actually use because it requires the largest accumulation of wealth. It's hard to achieve. It creates the lowest cash flow of any distribution strategy, the smallest amount of money coming to my house, and the highest tax of any strategy. So it's not a good strategy for me at all. It's great for the financial institution that I'm investing my money at because they build up a big pile of money and they get to keep holding it even after I retire. So it works well for them. It doesn't work well for me as the consumer. There are multiple other strategies. I'm only going to show a couple of them here today. But another example would be called amortization of an asset. And when we amortize an asset, we're not talking about a different asset. We're talking about the same $4 million dollars at the same bank, in the same bank account, same tax rate, same interest rate, no difference in where the money is. The difference is how I'm going to access it. And instead of leaving the money in the bank and living off the interest, in this example, I'm going to spend every dollar of this, in this example, over a 30 year period. So we're gonna take our 4 million from 4 million down to zero over a 30 year period. So if I'm 70 when I retire, then by the time I'm 100, it'll all be gone. That's probably okay, but we can talk more about that. But if I'm gonna take that money from 4 million down to zero, I can't simply have 153 grand a year coming out. I have to take 222. So that means I've got 222 coming on my house every single year. That's over a 40% increase in the gross cash flow that comes to my house every year. That's a big, big difference. When you increase your cash flow in retirement by 40%, that's a life-changing retirement. That's not the same kind of retirement. But notice the tax is the same. In fact, it's actually slightly less. And that's because not all of this 222 is taxable. Some of it is my money. I don't have to pay tax on it. This is non-qualified money. This is maybe the 4 million I got from selling my business. So my net cash flow is 189. That's almost a 60% increase in the net after-tax cash flow that my wife and I get to enjoy. And every year as the asset value goes down, even though my cash flow stays the same, my tax bill gets smaller every year because I have less interest. The same cash flow coming to my house, but less of it being taxed each year creates a cash flow that not only starts out almost 60% better, but it continues to rise. Eventually it's 70% better and then 80% better and then 85% better. Significantly better cash flow. In fact, over a 30 year period, if I'm over here doing the traditional strategy, I've got $4.6 million coming to my house and I have to give Uncle Sam a million of it. 
Over here, I have 6.6, an extra $2 million comes to my house, but I'm only giving Uncle Sam a fraction of the tax. So this is one of the tax avoidance strategies that I, that I alluded to earlier. This works really, really well from a cash flow standpoint and from a tax standpoint. The legacy value is smaller, which I'm actually okay with, especially since I might have other assets I can leave to my kids. The only real downside on this one is that if my wife or I live past 30 years, our money's now all gone and we have no more income. So that could be a problem. And so I wouldn't actually do this unless I had another bucket of money. We'll call this bucket A. I would also need to have a bucket B. And bucket B has to be sufficient so that when this money runs out, my other bucket of money, this comes down to the orchestration of assets, my other bucket of money then needs to be able to jump in and create the same $222,000 of after-tax cash flow for the rest of my life. And there are actually very simple ways to do that without sacrificing on the cash flow that we have here. I'll more on that at another time. So conceptually, I can have a much, much higher cash flow with a much, much lower tax without taking on any additional risk. Another strategy would be called annuitization. And with annuitization, what I do is I actually trade in my $4 million for a guaranteed cash flow. Now, the way the cash flow is calculated is this would be money that at retirement I would transfer to uh, an insurance company, not now, not to buy an insurance policy, but to trade it in for a guaranteed income for the rest of my life. And they only think I'm going to live maybe 16 or 17 years. So they're going to give me $278,000 a year, which is way, way more than 153. But look at the tax on this one. It's only $7,800 of tax. And that's because the IRS uses a special tax strategy for this. It's called an exclusion ratio. And essentially what they say is, if they're going to give me my money back over a 16 and a half year period, then we're going to divide 4 million by 16 and a half years and that part of the cash flow is not taxable at all. I only pay tax on the excess. My net cash flow is $270,000 a year, which is way more than double what I would have had with the traditional strategy. Now, eventually, after 16 and a half years, my tax bill goes up. You can see it's a much higher tax, but still my net cash flow is 216, which last time I checked was way more than 120. So this will always give me a much, much higher cash flow. Now, there's no legacy value with this. So we have a problem for the kids. I have to leave my kids something else, some other asset if I want to leave them anything. But from a cash flow standpoint, for my wife and I, this money will last as long as I live. Now, if my wife dies before me, I'm OK. I have this money for the rest of my life. The problem is if I die before my wife. Because the reason they're able to keep giving me this money for the rest of my life, even though they calculated it on a 16 year payout, is because while some people will in fact live longer, others will die sooner. And the day I die, this money is gone, which means my wife wouldn't get anything. And I love my wife, so I wouldn't actually do this unless, as I said before, I have another bucket of money sitting in the wings that can then recreate this cash flow for my wife when I'm done. And that other bucket can be anything I want. It, it could be a bucket of municipal bonds. It could be a bucket of vanilla ice cream or a bucket of tar. I don't care what it is as long as it gets the job done. So orchestrating these different assets allows us to take advantage of significantly better cash flow strategies. Now, as good as this looks, I simply used very easy numbers up here, tax numbers, to make it easy to understand the concept. But the reality is that 22% tax is not accurate because tax rates change. And in fact, I use the same tax rate on both sides. In reality, the taxes wouldn't be the same rate on both sides. These strategies actually get lower taxes. So let's take a quick look at how that works. Now, I'm using an old tax table here. It doesn't matter. I, I could update this to 2021. It's the same concept. This is, these are the 2018 rates. But if I have $4 million at 4% and I'm using that earnings distribution strategy, I'm going to get $153,000 of cash flow coming to my house. And all of it is taxable because it's interest. 
So the way our tax table actually works, most people understand marginal tax brackets, right? I'm, if I'm getting 153,000, I'm in a 22% marginal bracket. But that's not actually what I pay in tax because some of the money, the first in this case, 19,000, I only pay 10% tax. The next chunk I pay 12%, the last chunk I pay 22%. My total tax is $25,000, which is only 16.7% of what comes to my house. So I have an, a seven, uh, almost a 17% effective tax rate. But let's suppose I take that same formula, and let's actually, let's show you what that looks like. Here's, here's all the detail. I'm not gonna go through the detail, but here's my $153,000 coming to my house. Here's the scale on the left for dollars. On the right is my tax scale, and here's my 17% tax. If, on the other hand, I was to amortize that money using that amortization strategy, I'm going to have $222,000 coming to my house, but it's not all taxable. Only $151,000 of it is taxable. So while $222,000 comes to my house, only $151,000 of it goes through the tax table. That creates a tax of $25,000. My effective tax rate is not 17%. It's only 11%. So I've actually created a strategy here that lowers my rate of tax. If I put these side by side, you'll see that I've actually decreased my effective tax rate by 32%. I've decreased the actual amount of tax I pay by 2%, but I've increased my net after-tax cash flow by almost 54% from the same money with less risk. Most people are unaware of the fact that they have the ability to control their tax rates this way. Let's take a look at the amortization chart because it starts out with a lower tax rate to begin with. We're only at 11%, but each year as we move through time, not only do we have more money coming to the house, but our tax rate gets smaller and smaller and smaller every year, less and less tax every year. So this is a much more powerful strategy for distribution than simply living off the interest. If I annuitize, I get a still higher cash flow, 278, but in this one, only 35,000 of it is taxable. So a lot of money coming to my house, very little of it going to the tax table. My effective tax rate here is only one and a half percent, less than one and a half percent. So if we look at this side by side, next to earnings distribution, I'm reducing my effective tax rate by 91%. I'm, in, I'm decreasing my actual tax by 85%, and I'm increasing my net after-tax cash flow by 114%, over double the net after-tax cash flow. So here's what this one looks like. A much, much higher cash flow and only 1.5% tax for the first 16 years. Now, eventually my tax rate does go up. And if we look at these side by side, you'll see eventually the tax rate goes very, very high on this one. But even though it does, what you'll notice is over here, we have $154,000 at 16.7% tax. Over here, we start with 222 at only 11% tax and that tax rate goes down. Over here, we start with 278,000 of cash flow at only 1.4% tax, and eventually the tax rate goes up. But even when it does, my net after tax cash flow is still higher here than it would be in either of these other strategies. And again, it doesn't mean that this is what we should do with all of the money. It just means that for some of our money, we can take advantage of a much, much higher cash flow at a much, much lower rate of tax. But what we also have the ability to do, and this is another thing that most people aren't familiar with, is let's suppose that I also have a 401k with a million dollars in it. Now, I'm not going to amortize or annuitize my 401k. I'm going to just take required minimum distributions from that 401k. So when I click the next button, each of these charts is going to get a hump on the top of it to show the required minimum distributions. And the hump is going to be exactly the same size on all three because I'm gonna take the same amount of money out of my 401k in each of these scenarios. The difference is that I'm gonna pay a different rate of tax on the money I take out of my 401k. 
In the first example, I'm paying 18% tax on the money I pull out of my 401k. In the second example, I'm only paying 13% tax and it actually gets smaller every year. And in the fourth or the third example, I'm only taking 2.6% tax on my 401k. If I've got a million dollars in a 401k and I'm in an 18% effective tax bracket, then $180,000 of my million dollar 401k belongs to Uncle Sam. But if I use a different strategy with my non-qualified money, I can reduce the amount of tax I pay on my qualified money to 13%, in which case Uncle Sam only owns 130,000 of my 401k, or even to 2.6%, in which case Uncle Sam only owns $26,000 of my 401k. So there are ways to actually manage the effective tax rate, not only on my non-qualified money, but also on my qualified money, and also on my social security, and my pension, and my other taxable income, rental income, whatever, and even on my non -qual I mean my non-taxable income, I can create strategies that allow a client to have a much, much higher cash flow from the money they walk into retirement with, while at the same time dramatically reducing tax. 294 at 19%, 363 at 15%, 419 at 6.8%. If we can raise somebody's cash flow in retirement after the sale of their business, the successful sale of their business, to a very, very high cash flow, they're going to enjoy a much, much better lifestyle. And if at the same time we can put them into a lower tax rate, then we've done a great job. And if we're worried about this tax on the back end, what we ordinarily do is we use that bucket B, and when the tax rate goes up, we simply use bucket B to pay the extra tax so the client can continue to enjoy the cash flow they were enjoying the first half of their retirement. These types of strategies are available to everyone, and they create a significantly greater amount of cash flow in retirement. Traditional earnings distribution in this example would have only given this client over a 30 year period $8 million of net after tax cash flow when they could maybe have had 10 and a half or even 11 and a half million from the same money with less risk. It's just better. And knowing how to, how to locate the assets on the balance sheet and orchestrate them in retirement is incredibly valuable. We can create by focusing on on better location of the wealth, we can create the opportunity to use tax avoidance strategies that, that might otherwise be not available to the client based on where they locate their wealth. We have to measure taxation on real tax tables rather than just arbitrary assumptions of tax rate, which is what, what most financial planners do. And we can generate actual tax rate reduction that affects all of a client's cash flows in retirement by orchestrating the assets in a, in a way to create that maximum cash flow, minimize the tax, make sure they never run out of money, and still meet all of their legacy objectives. So in order to do this well, as Zach said, you've got to know how to grow the value of the business by managing the finances properly, managing the way the business runs, and managing the people in such a way as to grow the value of the business. You have to create an effective, high probability, successful exit strategy that will actually work. And then you have to plan on how you're going to position and utilize that wealth to create those high cash flow, low tax strategies. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ted to see if we have any questions in the queue. Bob, thank you. That was. Um... Very well done and very comprehensive, Zach. Thank you as well. Um, just a reminder, we did have a, a good amount of people that got on late, uh, or at, I should say after the start here on my introduction. You, if there is any questions, please feel free to, to type them into the question feature and go to webinar. Uh, we have not gotten any to date. Um, so I'm going to give it a little bit of time, a couple seconds here to see if anything comes in. Um, obviously, you know, Zach and Bob's contact information is on the screen here. Um, if you're more comfortable connecting with them directly, 
uh, on a one-on-one -on -one question, please obviously feel free to do that. Um, we did get one here. Give me a second. While, while you're reading that, Ted, I just wanted to say, you know, Zach and I are more than happy if anybody has questions after this. Feel free to reach out. We're happy to answer questions. We don't charge for answers. Uh, we're, we're happy to provide information to anyone in the, in the organization. Uh, it be our pleasure to help you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I'm going to read this verbatim. What are the six asset classes you mentioned earlier? What are your thoughts on ESO, ESOPs? So ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, are uh, often a way that business owners will look to liquidate or, or get out of exit from their business. And ESOPs are, are a great strategy. They're available. Um, they work generally. Um, they're a little more complicated than, than uh, some people think they are. Like, it sounds like a great thing on the surface. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. And through my four decades of experience, um, while they look real good on the way in, a lot of times they don't look as good on the way out. They're a little more difficult on the way out. But we do use them where it's the most appropriate. The key is to not just pick something and say, hey, I think I want to do this. The key is to figure out what actually works best for a particular business owner or a particular business in their particular situation. And there's a lot of different options, and we try to weigh them out to figure out what strategies are going to work best for a client and then present those. Um, and as far as the six different uh, types of assets, they are personal property, which is you know your personal belongings, your cars, your furniture, your clothes, things like that savings which are anything any assets that are not in the market and not part of a qualified plan things like savings accounts checking accounts certain types of insurance products cds money markets those types of things no downside market risk investments which is money that is in the market and does have downside market risk uh, but it's not part of a qualified plan retirement plans which are the qualified plans by the way, they are often invested in the market and have downside market risk as well, but they're part of a qualified tax, uh, tax qualified plan. Um, real estate, which is personally owned real estate, not business owned real estate, but personally owned real estate. And finally, the business or businesses that a client owns. You can't own an asset without it fitting into one of those six categories. And each one works very differently during accumulation. And each one works very differently in, in terms of retirement. So I hope that answers the question for you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what? Sorry. What? What are some tactics to consider if you have an outside sale? So outside sales, you know, again, the the key is going back to that previous slide. You let me just see if I can get my slide up here. Um, we want to grow the business, but if we're if we're building a business for an outside sale, if the plan is to make do an outside sale, then there are things that we're going to focus more on, like people management becomes especially important, as Zach said earlier, in an outside sale, um, because the business, as Zach pointed out, if somebody's going to buy your business when you retire, they don't want you. They're not looking for you. Um, so you actually have to figure out ways to hand off more and more of the management responsibilities of the company to the people who work for you, do less and less over time, which might be appealing, by the way, um, because when the new owner takes over, you're not going to be part of it. So there are things like that that you have to do, but there are also tactics we can we can set up to create additional value for the business owner upon exit. Sometimes we set up executive benefit programs to create additional value for the business owner. Um, what I also find, though, is a lot of times business owners will decide that their plan is to sell to an outsider. And then, unfortunately, when they get ready to retire, the outsider they plan to sell it to disappears. Or maybe they've had lots of people knocking on their door wanting to buy their company. And then suddenly the, around the time they're ready to sell, nobody's knocking on the door anymore. So whether we're planning on an inside sale or an outside sale, it's a good idea to have a backup plan just in case things don't go as planned. So we also work with clients on making sure that they have a backup plan. Yeah, you said, um, 
I should all know that, you know, we're actually already working with the Royal Dealer in, in Connecticut regarding, you know, the first thing we said is we, you have to start passing on some of your responsibilities because he was doing too much. And if he had sold the business, they, they weren't getting him, which isn't useful to the seller, to the buyer. So he's already started doing that. And just to that, you know, one thing I always think about when we do these uh, these webinars is the reason the franchising model is so popular in the United States is because you're buying a business in a box. And that's not to say that any of your businesses are that. But the, the more the business runs itself, the better, the more attractive it will be to an outsider. Thank you, guys. Um... Seeing no more questions and seeing that it's 10 a.m. here on the dot, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I'd like, Zach, Bob, like to appreciate, like to thank you, excuse me, for your time and your expertise here this morning. Again, very insightful, very comprehensive. Um, obviously, remind everyone that their contact information is on the screen. There will be a survey going out. Um, it's, it's customized for their presentation. I encourage you. Um, you know, we're always looking for feedback, uh, not only for our webinar series, but I think Zach and Bob are in general. So if you could take a couple minutes and fill that out, we would appreciate it. I uh, would also like to remind everyone that's on that we are continuing the webinar series next month. We actually have a three-part series with FMCSA um, on various regulatory items that impact your business. So I encourage you to sign up for that. And I guess before we, before we wrap up here, Zach, Bob, any closing comments? It was a pleasure to meet you all, e meet you all. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, if you have any questions like Bob said, feel free to reach out. You should also know in the survey itself, there's a section, I mean, we want the feedback, that's what's most important, but if you want us to reach out to you to set up some kind of consultation, um, you can provide your name, rank, and serial number in the survey itself and it'll get sent to us. But, and we're happy to help however we can. You know, our, our goal is to help businesses in this industry and uh, that's our goal. Very good. All right. Guys, thank you. Everyone, hope you have a great rest of the day, and thanks for joining us this morning. Take care. Take care, everyone. Have a good one.